Charlotte, and today Brian and I are here with Julian Treasure. He is chairman of the Sound Agency and an international expert and speaker on communication skills. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so glad to talk about Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, Julian, before we kind of dive into listening and communicating, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and that journey to communications? Sure, yes. Uh, studied economics at Cambridge University and then my first job actually was in advertising with a company that you guys have probably heard of called Saatchi and Saatchi and um, I was a media buyer there. I left after about two years to become a professional musician for a while and got very broke as most people do who go that route uh, but I made some records and had a lot of fun. <clears throat> then I got a job selling advertising space so I went on to the other side of uh, the divide from the agency to uh, the media, uh, setting advertising space in computer magazines and uh, did that, became a marketing director of a publishing company uh, in the UK, well actually an American publishing company, Computer World in the UK and I left in 88, so yes I am that old, uh, to, to start my own business which was called TPD, it was a contract publishing company and I think you guys do branded content as it's known now, this was producing customer magazines, largely for computer companies in those days. And that grew and grew. We ended up producing beautiful global magazines for companies like Lexus, Microsoft, Apple, and so forth. And uh, I sold that in 2002 uh, to Interpublic. And then I wanted to do something else and bring the two sides of me together, really, because I'd been a musician all the way through that. And uh, so it was music and marketing, sound and marketing. I formed the Sound Agency in 2003. So it's now 17 years old, amazingly, asking and answering the question, how does your brand sound? Which is not a question many brands were asking back then. Uh, so we've kind of, <clears throat> I suppose, been instrumental in growing the market for audio branding, as it's called now. And uh, then uh, I got to do some TED Talks along the way, wrote a book, and <clears throat> I started thinking about communication skills, not just of organizations, about the sound organizations are making and, and consuming as well, but also us as individuals. So it was that move that happened in the TED Talks, really. My third one was about listening. The fourth one about designing environments around us which are conducive to communication. And the fifth one was about speaking. And that one went absolutely ballistic. It's been seen by uh, tens of millions of people. I think it's the fifth most watched TED Talk of all time now, amazingly. Um, so since that, you know, I've spent a lot of time traveling the world, talking about sp speaking and listening skills, the, the crucial life skills that we forget, that we don't teach at school, mm -hmm. which is so important. So I've, I've got a two-track life really now. I still run the sound agency. We're... Um, we're still doing great things around the world for brands. And at the same time, uh, I wrote another book called How to Be Heard. And I, I do a lot of work with people and I do courses and so forth and speaking and listening skills. So let's, let's start with the marketing aspect and let's talk a little bit about that vital role that communication really plays in, in building a brand. You know, how important is communication on both sides, the, the, the communicating and the listening. Well, it's a very interesting thing. There was a, a big study of organizations a few years ago called the Organizational Listening Project. And it found on average that organizations put 80% of their resources, budgets, attention, effort into communicating outbound. In other words, speaking and only 20% into listening. And that kind of rings true with me because the TED talk I did on speaking has been seen by five times as many people <laughs> as the TED talk I did on listening. So that's a kind of uh, a very small piece of research, but I think uh, it, it tends to validate what the organizational listening project found. And the question is, does it matter? And it does matter. You know, when you say communication in an organizational sense, we immediately think of PR advertising, marketing, outbound, 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 yeah. even social media, outbound. We think very little about listening to people. And yet 
brands are co-created now. You know, you launch a brand and it's no longer yours, is it? It goes off into the world and it gets social media to pieces and people communicate with each other, their understanding, and that morphs, it changes. So my goodness, if you're a brand and you're not listening, then that's a really bad place to be. Um, and actually that piece of research found that the organizations which rated lowest on listening had a lot less loyalty. Uh, they had dissatisfied staff. They had more crises. Uh, they had more problems in all sorts of areas. The ones that rated higher had lots of good things going on. Uh, so it does matter and it does affect the bottom line. Right. So when, when you talk about listening, right, it's not just, it's not just, seeing what's coming in, right? Those messages. It's, is it also communicating back out to those users or people in, you know, say it's a social spirit, like communicating and having that two-way communication as a brand with those people that are, you know? Yes, I think listening is the doorway to understanding. And if you start out with the intention of understanding your customers, your prospects, all your stakeholders, everybody's important to you really, then that takes work. You know, just as if we're in conversation, Brian, and I, I am listening to you, that's work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a natural capability. Hearing is a natural capability. Listening is a skill. It's a skill that we can improve and so can organizations big time. It takes work to do it well. So it's effort, it's intention. And not many organizations, sadly, have that intention, that will to listen to all of the people who matter. Uh, you, you have to put it into a culture. You know, it's not just uh, an email going around saying, tomorrow we're going to become a listening organization. <laughs> it actually takes looking at the culture, the behavior, training. It takes remuneration, appraisal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder how many people listening to this, you know, you might have 360 degree appraisals. Is the question, how good is this person at listening in there at all? I bet probably not. And yet it's such an important part of leadership and of having an organization which works. You know, I, I mean, I can tell you a little story. I, when I sold my agency, there was a, there was a London agency that uh, I was very involved with, which was run by a man who was terrifying. He was known to be terrifying. He was so frightening um, and so kind of judgmental that people would not take bad news to him. And over a period of years, what happened is the agency started to live a fantasy life. People were claiming they had business they didn't have. They were claiming they still had business they'd lost. They were claiming they'd won business that they had never won. And the accounts ended up being fantasy and they all had to be restated. It caused a major scandal. Uh, the guy had to be fired. I mean, that's what happens if you have a culture of not listening to people. So I, on the other on the other you know, end of that is that outward communication, that outbound communication. And when brands are doing the right thing by listening, they're also, I mean, majority, like you said, are, are doing a lot of speaking. Now, how, how we love storytelling. We are big on storytelling. We love, love storytelling. You know, how important is it for brand to weave in storytelling to their strategy when they are speaking to their audiences? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Storytelling is wonderful. It's engaging as long as it's, it's relevant and valuable and congruent. When I mean, that's a word we use a lot at the sound agency, because we're talking about brands. You know, I think great brands are all about consistency. And that means being congruent and consistent in all the senses. So not just visual, but auditory as well. And smell, touch and taste if, if you exist in those senses. And over time, and in every encounter. So you don't just make a promise. I mean, stories can be marvelous to engage people and have them understand the thing. You also still need to deliver the experience as well. So the story needs to become real. And uh, that's not always the case with brands. There are some brands I can think of who've told great, st great stories in the past and failed to deliver them. So, you know, in my, in my TED talk, I talked about the importance of integrity, which is being your word. I think that is to say, if you say it, it happens. Right. So by all means, tell a wonderful story, mm -hmm. make sure it becomes real 
for the people who experience your brand. I, I know you're also talking one of your TED talks. I'm not sure which one it was, but you talk about like exaggeration, right? So in storytelling, you know, do a lot of brands sometimes exaggerate too much in their storytelling where it, it, it loses its integrity, right? There becomes fiction in it to what we were just talking yeah. about. Yes, definitely. And you know, I think there's a, there's a language inflation going on, which is unfortunate. Once upon a time, it was okay to be excited about something. Now we have to be super excited. <laughs> And, you know, maybe in a few years we'll have to be hyper excited or mega excited or something because super excited won't be enough. So this kind of uh, it's hyperbole, which mm. is an old Greek word. It means throwing beyond mm. and hyperbole becomes um, desensitizing. And we all eventually have to start shouting and being exaggerative about everything, which is unfortunate. Uh, so, yes, I think there's a great deal <clears throat> which brands can do in terms of being real being honest, uh, being genuine, authentic, and having integrity in what they say. Do you think that's because um, as a, you know, it's not, I, I would say as a country, but I don't think it's, it's any one country. Do you think it's just because as humans, we, we need more out of, out of everything. And so the brand is trying to meet the more and, and not fall behind, or is it that they're trying to just stand out from the crowd by getting very, very excited and, you know, about, you know, is it the, are they, are they catering to the human desire for more or just to, you know, how do I get better faster and stand out from the competition? I think that's an interesting point. We are in a kind of slightly grim dance of more all the time. And there's a lot of debate about that now, you know, there are countries like Bhutan where they have a national policy of increasing happiness, <laughs> not gross national product. And it seems to work. Uh, so there's quite a lot of countries which are now appointing, you know, ministers for happiness and things like that. Um, it's a question of what we want more of, really, isn't right. it? And uh, whether that's valuable. More money, more goods? Mm, perhaps, perhaps not. But we all know what that's doing to the planet. So uh, I, think, I think that's a really Im important question for brands to ask and to answer. What, what are they actually delivering to people ultimately? And uh, exaggerating... You know, it's fine from time to time, but I, I mean, I said in the TED talk, it's one of the seven deadly sins of speaking that I, I talked about. If it becomes a habit, you know, if it's endemic, then it's desensitizing and people cease to believe mm -hmm. the hyperbole. It's almost like swearing, you know, when you curse so yeah. much that it, no, you know, you become in, in desensitized. It doesn't even faze mm -hmm. people anymore. Absolutely. It it's, uh, Absolutely. Bigger. it's supposed to prove a point, but now you use it so much. Yeah. Right. And if everything's awesome or you're super excited about everything, what are you really right. excited about? Right. You know, that's, that's really yeah. what it becomes. It loses its. That's it. The word awesome. I, I mentioned in that talk, as I said, you know, if, if a pair of trainers is awesome, how do you describe a sunset? You know, the word has gone and it's been devalued. So this right. language inflation is something which I think we do need to be a little bit concerned about. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to shift back to listening and, and for a second, when, so what is really the difference in terms of listening to what is the difference between oral communication and the written word when it comes to either a brand or even just an individual, you know, getting a point across or getting their message across. Do some people listen better to the written word as opposed to the spoken word? For sure. Yes. I mean, there's no doubt that, um, spoken is more powerful in general uh, we've been speaking to each other with complex language for probably probably a hundred thousand years writing was only invented four thousand years ago so it's a much deeper kind of human human capability to communicate like this by talking to each other and listening to each other and it's become a little bit marginalized really in the last 50 years particularly since we invented email and text and instant messaging and social media we think of communicating involving the fingers and the eyes. Mm -hmm. And that is going to change, I think, with the rise of what's undoubtedly, undoubtedly going to be intelligent agents. We will be speaking to the internet. We'll have our own little Jarvis from Iron Man, uh, which will be artificially intelligent. And so I think communication this way is on the up again, I'm glad to say. Um, but, you know, if you think of the difference between reading a Shakespeare play and seeing it or hearing it delivered, I mean, the three levels of it, I suppose, you've got reading it, 
flat on the page. There's no prosody, there's no intonation, mm -hmm. there's no pace, there's no timbre. All the things I talked about in that TED talk in the vocal toolbox, they're missing. Mm -hmm. uh, then you, you could hear it, on an, it as an audio uh, play and it would be immensely more powerful. Seeing it, of course, when you've got all the senses engaged uh, the, the smell of the theater, you're seeing the people, you're, you're feeling the air moving around you and you know, you're actually in the moment. Multisensory is the most powerful. And that's why brands have to always remember that we experience the world in five senses, not one. And that's where they go so wrong in obsessing about how things look all the time. So I have, oh, wait, I, hold on, hold on. I have a question. I, hold on. Do you think that then with, you know, cause you mentioned texting, you know, text messaging, do you, th is it that folks who are more inclined to communicate, let's say via text or be able to express things via text that they can't say in the spoken word, are, are they, are their communication skills diminished? Is that? Well, no, I think, I think uh, that all the channels have got their own place and they, they've got, there are times and places where it's more suitable. Uh, I know there are plenty of younger people who prefer to ask somebody out or break up with somebody by text. Well, it's safer, isn't it? You don't have to see the but response. Isn't that You're not actually the present. Skills? Do they have? The right but do they have the right skills? Is it that they they because we have these defaults, mm -hmm. they're not honing those communication skills. They're relying on something as as you know, like a text message, so impersonal to communicate. That is, uh, yeah, that is undeniably true. Uh, and, and it's been remarked on by so many people, for example, in the interview scenarios where people are being interviewed for jobs and they do not know how to present themselves with their voice because they're so used to typing and reading. Uh, so it has displaced the capacity. And, uh, you know, also, I think you have to go right back to the beginning. We teach reading and writing at school. We do not teach speaking and listening at school. And this to me is insanity because they are crucial life skills. And yet this incredible instrument we all play, the human voice, and the skill of listening, which is often mistaken for a capability, are things we expect children to pick up informally as they go along. That's mad. You know, these things are critical for so, our outcomes in life. If you, if you want to lead and persuade and understand and relate and, and connect with people. Right. So is it not just the listening and those other skills they need, but is it also like, I don't know how to say this, but like stage presence, right? You were in the music industry. It teaches you some sort of stage presence, how to, I don't want to say perform in front of people, but how to be in front of people and express yourself. You see a lot of people who have like, they may be minored in acting and they're just really good presenters because they sort of have that presence. Is that something that actually makes a better speaking skill set or a better, it make, makes you better to be able to get your point across when you're actually communicating with people. Oh, definitely. I mean, I want to be really clear. All the things we're talking about, listening, mm -hmm. speaking, and presenting or speaking to an audience, these are skills, and they're skills that anybody can master. It's just like anything else. I mean, the old adage is it takes 10,000 hours, isn't it, to master anything? I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what people say. Uh, nevertheless, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes practice. So when I'm training people on public speaking skills, for example, I talk about three things, PPD, practice, prepare, and deliver. And the practice bit is so important. I, you know, I, I, I give talks, well, I used to give talks around the world, not so much now, but, you know, I, I do webinars and things. Mm -hmm. um, to senior executives hundreds of them mm -hmm. and i'll say how many of you have to present to other people a forest of hands go up mm -hmm. interesting how many of you have had formal vocal training two or three people always and i just uh, i find that amazing that if this is so important if you have to sell persuade lead inspire educate whatever it might be it's, if it's your job if it matters to you why would you not take these skills seriously and train yourself in them. Mm -hmm. That's why I've, I've got a book, I've got a course, you know, I've, I'm doing my bit as best I can to, to uh, you know, thump the table here and say, guys, speaking and listening matter to the way you present yourself and to your outcomes in life. Okay, so then to, to that point, what would you consider a terrible public speaker and how could a terrible public speaker improve if you know on the fly if I, think we just I know he's I know <laughs> trained, right so but 
Is there a way, if you had to give some tips to public speakers right now, you know, is there something that, you know, that they can do to improve in a shorter period of time? Maybe they won't be. Yeah, great. for sure. For sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, I've seen some people who really struggle because they just don't have the skills. One thing is nervousness, right? Now, that's not a terrible public speaker. That's natural. And if, that, if it's true that people are terrified of public speaking and when they stand up, therefore, they start getting really nervous. The big antidote to that, guys, is breathe. Take a huge, deep breath. And if your voice goes like this when you go on stage, a big, deep breath will settle that right down. It's also the fuel for your voice. So breathing is very important. Um, it's okay to be nervous. Everybody gets nervous before they do something until they've done it a lot of times. So nerves is not a bad thing. What is a bad thing, I think, is <clears throat> not paying attention to the skill, not connecting with the audience. So I'll give you a couple of things which I've seen many, many people do, which I think are quite damaging. One is it's all about me, right? The audience is there to give me lots of praise. That is fatal. If it's not about you. It's about the gift you're giving to the audience. And if you wish them well and you're trying to give a great gift to them, you'll connect and it'll all be fine. Uh, the second thing is people who prepare their content and read it in some way, shape or form. I'm not a big fan of reading writing. Uh, I think it's quite dry. And these days, if you're looking down, you're not connecting with your eyes to the audience mm -hmm. and they'll probably disconnect quite severely. The worst form of that actually is people who put lots of bullet points on slides on a screen behind them and then turn around and start reading the screen. You know, that, uh, that's just rude, turning your back on the audience like that. I wouldn't use bullet points at all, actually. I'm a great fan of Gar Reynolds and his book, Presentation Zen, which is brilliant and uh, really guides people in how to use slides effectively. So those are a couple of things. Practice, you know, Toastmasters is out there. I'm sure they're still working even in lockdown. Uh, I'm sure there'll be virtual Toastmasters meetings going on all over the world, form a buddy group, get a coach, uh, do some vocal coaching, you know, working on it like this with people and anybody can become a, a really good presenter if they work at it like that. Okay. Now you were a little bit in the tech space then. And so you, I don't know if you've worked with engineers, but sometimes they're brilliant. And they just don't have the communication skills, um, even even written communication. So this could be, you know, sp spoken word. There maybe I'm not going to generalize, but I'm going to generalize. <laughs> maybe they're a little bit every engineer. <laughs> socially not, you know, that they're just they're not used to communicating very uh, with ease. I'm trying to be politically correct here um, with ease, but they're geniuses. So how? Can someone with all of this information, I mean, in a field like that, how do they get their, you know, what are, what kind of guidance could we give engineers? I'm just using that as an example. Someone that's technical, like technical folks technical. who yeah. have the knowledge and need to relay that um, in a way that everybody can understand. Well, it's an inc that's another interesting question. I remember asking this to Chris Anderson, the head of TED. Um, and I said to him, Chris, which is most important, content or delivery? Mm -hmm. And he said, given a choice, I mean, they're both important, of course, but given a choice, content every time. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody has got riveting content, really important content, and they're delivering in a very gauche or slow or tedious way, mm -hmm. you kind of stay with it <clears throat> because the content is so important. Mm -hmm. Whereas if somebody is speaking a vapid nonsense, but doing it brilliantly, it's just irritating because <laughs> they could be That's doing some more with that skill. Yeah, you've got a point. So, so I think, you know, I wouldn't be scared if I were highly academic and found it, you know, interpersonal uh, communication very challenging. You can still work at it. I'm not saying everybody is going to be, you know, Brian Robertson or Ken Robinson, mm -hmm. but it is possible to get yourself to a level where you'll get the ball over the net. Mm -hmm. you know, where what you're doing on stage or the way you deliver isn't an obstacle. That's the first step. Uh, and I think anybody can get to that level with practice, mm -hmm. with effort. Uh, and I do encourage academics to do that because, I mean, uh, my goodness, I've been to some lectures where, mm -hmm. you know, the delivery was so shocking. 
the information was important, but the delivery was so shocking. It was so hard to stay awake or to stay with it. And they're doing a disservice to their students. So it, it's a skill they need to practice just like everybody else. Yeah. Especially if you're in that education in the academic era, you know, you're presenting all the time, like teaching is a form of presentation. So, you know, you should definitely work on exactly. getting better. At it. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, look at Ken Robinson's number one TED talk of all time. Uh, and he's from the academic um, or the, the educational sector. And that was a wonderful talk about the importance of uh, doing this kind of thing in a, an inspiring way. Brian, did you have anything else you wouldn't talk to John? No, I, 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 I know I've watched your talks. I think everyone should watch your talks. It was a, it was a pleasure meeting you, Julian. Um, can you tell everyone where, oh, thank you. Uh, they could, where they could find out more about you? Of course, yes. Well, um, the Sound Agency, which is audio branding, is at thesoundagency.com. And we, we now have soundscapes for well-being and productivity in offices and hospitals and places like that, which is really exciting new stuff. And can combat COVID to a degree as well. Um, my own work is at juliantreasure.com uh, if it's speaking or listening skills. Uh, and do pop by because actually we're just about to announce, I'm doing a webinar in about two weeks time awesome. about virtual communication uh, because I keep getting asked. Everybody keeps saying to me, how do we do this stuff? What are the rules? You know, we don't know what the etiquette is. How do I look good when I'm <laughs> presenting, you know, on a camera and so forth. So, um, lights cameras action all that stuff uh, so pop by juliantreasure.com sign up and we'll keep you abreast of that we'll send over a link you have a link on the website correct we'll put over we'll put a link in the description too so you guys can check that out i i certainly want to check that out definitely definitely julian it was a, an honor and a pleasure to meet you thank you oh thank you guys it's been lots of fun thank you